Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. And for those of you who do not know what Impetus Digital does, my company has built and developed some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools. We work with life science companies like pharmaceutical, medical device, biotech companies to help them with their virtual advisory boards, steering committees, co-author working groups. And we have, since COVID-19, helped numerous teams with the rollouts of their brand plans, sales and MSL training, et cetera. But more importantly here at Impetus, we believe in extending the conversation beyond the brand, having these beyond the pill conversations. We want to leverage the Impetus Insight platform to be the platform for big, hairy, audacious goals things that are gonna be leading edge in the healthcare space. So we wanna leverage, for example, like the way we were doing with our podcast and YouTube channel, to be that bridge for, you know, with the provocateurs, people like the Eugenes of the world who are doing things that are different, mystifying, important and leading edge, so that we can all collectively work together to positively disrupt healthcare. So I'm so positively um, intrigued and inspired and honored that we have Eugene Barakovich here with us today, um, super entrepreneur, and he's got a great background. He literally is a serial intra and entrepreneur, so he has a corporate background as well to boot. Um, he's been an executive, a venture builder, speaker, board advisor, and he's always had his focus on digital health, which is one of my favorite topics. He's also the chairman and founding board member at Your Health um, your coach health. And we're going to dig into that because there's some really great nuggets in what he's doing with that. And he's also the founder of Initium Impact Ventures. So we're going to want to explore that further with him. But prior to these current roles, Eugene served as the global head of digital health at Bayer. So big pharma, big pharma company, and love to know what he had done around that as well. So he also previously co-founded and sold a doctor rating startup and a consulting company. In addition, Eugene hosts a popular YouTube and podcast series called Shot of Health uh, Digital Health Therapy, which is actually how I discovered him myself. And he and his co host interview some of the brightest minds in the industry. So, welcome, Eugene. So happy to have you on our show today. Thank you, Natalie. Um, you just aged me because as you were describing a lot of this, I was like, whoa. <laughs> Who's that guy that talking about? sound old. And, and, and also, uh, I was never called a provocateur, so uh, that's a good one for me. But. In this day and age, anything in digital, we are the provocateurs. So, yeah, so, true, true. so um, I do want to ask you, though, very interesting background. I love the fact that you have a pharma background. So do I. How long were you in pharma? You obviously had a really interesting digital role at Bayer. Tell us a little bit about your trajectory in your career, how you ended up in pharma, and how you actually evolved into that digital lead space as well. Uh, you know, I won't, I won't go uh, aging myself too much, uh, but I actually started outside of health and healthcare and health tech, whichever term you use. Um, I started actually in entertainment um, and very much tech uh, oriented roles. Um, actually, Inside Pharma uh, was only for about three and a half years. I, I did spend prior to that um, 10 years in a pharmacy benefit manager, which at the time was called Metco. So I, I kind of said, I always joke around, I always danced around pharma, right? And it's the whole frenemy discussions between pharma and PBMs. Um, but Inside Pharma, which was uh, honestly a very fascinating three and a half year journey, uh, was literally only three and a half years. Um, I also do joke around that I lost most of my hair in those three and a half years. <laughs> not, not true. Fantastic. And how did you end up in the digital space? Um, I mean, the, you know, my background is in technology, but early on in my career, I uh, kind of recognized that technology is honestly useless unless you can actually put it in people's hands. Um, and uh, that consumers, uh, and in this case, health consumers and patients actually use it, right? Um, so I think that's uh, one of the biggest, uh, sorry, my, uh, yeah, that's the video, all good. Um, uh, yeah, so it just ended up, 
going into the pharma space and the digital space, and that's my background, right? I mean, I kind of was born in, in tech. Uh, I had a startup back in the day while I was at Metco uh, in the doctor rating space. So that was already kind of how do doctors come online? How do they, you know, patients were rating them back in the day. This was in 2008. Um, and then it was an interesting opportunity that came my way for buyer or Bayer, and I couldn't say no. <laughs> Now, pharma, as you had alluded to, is a very interesting world. It's got the golden hand handcuffs concept, meaning they pay you big, you're in the big corporate space, you're treated well, you have lots of people to delegate to, and there's many, many other advantages. But certainly, we've also faced the fact that it's a very stringent infrastructure. There's tons of compliance and internal regulations and guidance and legal specifications, and the list goes on. Tell us a little bit about what that experience was. Um, what were some of the lessons learned and what were some of the frustrations that potentially prompted you on getting out of pharma? Yeah, um, so first of all, and uh, I am actually writing a book uh, with a going title of Heart Pill to Swallow, an entrepreneur's journey through the belly of the beast. Um, so lots, lots and lots of lessons learned. Um, you know, I think one of the, you know, one of the things uh, I'll, I'll kind of start uh, going through a couple of items. So one, you know, obviously to your point, uh, and I always said this to my team, we are uh, talking about us, the human beings, and our and our bodies and livelihood, and so it is absolutely important. And I think the regulations are there for a reason, right? Um, on the other sort of component that level of experimentation uh, in digital with digital business models and I always looked at it in two ways one is how do you augment uh, and speed up the existing processes and then how do you look at new revenue streams outside of the core business right and in my opinion the latter actually nobody in the health and care ecosystem has really really figured that out yet Right. You know, if you look at the overall ecosystem, you got pharma that really has two touch points with their ultimate end consumer of that pill. Um, and that's during the patient support programs and earlier on in the clinical trials. You know, I think insurers are getting much more aggressive. We got the tech giants, you know, have been getting into that space for a number of years and we've seen more. Um, so I think kind of the short version um, of this, um, there's been a lot of challenges uh, for pharma to understand what does digital mean to them outside of improving the molecular R&D processes. And, and I would also include, you know, um, things like cell therapy, so different modalities, but still biological in nature. Um, and then uh, on the digital side, do you augment, you know, this beyond the pill concept that uh, I think, you know, pharma has been talking about it for many years. Uh, or do you look at something maybe pill does not need to be there, right? So, and I look at uh, digital therapeutics and I'll, I'll say maybe the purest form of it, a good example to me is like a Keeley, right? Um, so I'll, I'll pause here because I, I can keep talking for hours, but. I have you honestly, Eugene, I am so, uh, I'm so tolling with you and completely in sync. I actually wrote a book called The Healthcare Heretic a couple of years ago, very much on these topics. It's, a, it's actually available on Amazon and I'm releasing the audiobook on Audible shortly as well. But I love what you're saying and I love the concept. I spoke a lot also about the beyond the pill. It's a really, it's so eloquently said, a hard pill to swallow. But literally we are in the, the precipice of the brand new business model and what that looks like. And let's explore that if we have some time at, in a moment. But I do wanna take an opportunity to say that you left pharma to become an entrepreneur. Now, you have actually started and co-founded and the CEO of Your Coach. Um, what's interesting is you are doing this with your co-founder, your wife, Marina. And we actually saw in one of your YouTube videos that the two of you have been referred to as the Beyonce and Jay-Z power couple of digital health. So let's kind of take a backtrack a little bit about you starting off in your trajectory after working for companies, you know, big pharma and small digital companies, but going off on your own, becoming the Beyonce and Jay-Z power couple, what is, the, what is the, the objective or the premise behind starting this company and what was it like getting into the entrepreneurship world? 
So when I was inside pharma, I was kind of saying I'm a recovering entrepreneur. Um, and then when I, the moment I stepped away, I kind of say, started saying, uh, as actually my co-host says, Jim Joyce, that he's a recovering executive. So I, you know, but uh, I think in all in all, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, the background of the company, and then I'll kind of go into uh, the, the Jay-Z and Beyonce. Uh, Marina, my wife, um, you know, while we were living in Amsterdam back in the day, she was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, went through, I mean, the system was actually, did its job biologically. Um, one of the things she realized very quickly um, is that the healthcare system, while again, the docs and, and the hospital system and the breast cancer institute she was part of did an amazing, amazing job, right? But they took care of her biology, uh, but they forgot about parts of her mind, parts of her body, and parts of her soul. <laughs> and so she was basically, quote unquote, hacking her body back to health, both you know, mentally and physically, um, and uh, went to an online health coaching school uh, to basically get um, you know, more qualifications to really understand what it's really about. And then actually came to myself and, and Dan, who was my partner in the other startup, and said, you know, create me a toy because I haven't been able to, now that I'm starting to practice with my clients as a health coach, I need something to manage the business and I haven't been able to find anything modern and good, right? So actually, she started building this towards to end of 2018, some of 2019, uh, almost like as an MVP, um, and um, you know when we saw, you know, uh, I mean, she's a first-time digital health tech entrepreneur. She's had businesses in the past in other areas, and it was an awesome opportunity. As we always joke around, uh, because we got some questions from investors, like, well, you know, we don't normally invest in husband-wife. And, you know, our answer was, what a better way to go on a journey. Um, and we've raised two beautiful products, aka our teenage girls, 16 and 18. And now it's time to, you know, basically have another baby born, now a digital version product, <laughs> um, and, and take it to adolescence and beyond, right? Um, so that's a little bit of the background. Um, the Jay-Z and Beyonce, to be honest, um, Jessica DeMassa, who runs the WTF Health, What's the Future Health, um, also podcast interview series. Um, there's a little bit of her idea. Um, you know, we never thought of it that way. Um, and we're pr probably going to go out and challenge Katya and Unity um, uh, out of Startup Health uh, because I think they're probably quote unquote competitors of ours in, the, in that area. <laughs> <laughs> so let's actually dip into that. So this is kind of the mainstay of your business right now is the focus on your health. Can you tell us a little bit about what this company does? What is the yeah. services and products you're providing? So at the core of it, um, you know, and for the, I'll say healthcare listeners, think of your coach health as a practice fusion or Dr. Krona for health and wellness coaches. Um, health and wellness coaches uh, has gotten a lot of tailwinds in, um, you know, really the industry has been there for 15 to 20 years, but it's a practice management solution on one side. And we are, as a young startup, really, uh, you know, officially incorporated as your coach health in January of this year. Uh, we're exploring other business models surrounding it, uh, basically a marketplace between clients and coaches, right? So on one side, uh, they use the platform to manage their business on a daily basis, everything from administrative components. So things like you know, taking payments, uh, task management, video messaging. Um, and then on the other side, uh, uh, the more they practice with their existing clients, the more um, work they would have potentially available to them based on a number of uh, components. Very interesting. So would you say in some ways your health is almost like the Amazon or the Shopify where you're kind of acting like a marketplace? Is that, is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, so we're, we're a bit of a marketplace. It's not, um, uh, again, it's one of the models that we're exploring now. Um, on, again, on one side, we've been uh, you know, laser focused on providing the best experience possible to the health coaches. Uh, as Marina always said, you know, the moment they start using uh, the platform, uh, she really wants that to become their home, 
right, uh, in managing their client. Um, and then, yes, it's becoming more of a marketplace, but we're exploring a number of models and, and on the client side there. So let's just say, for example, <clears throat> I'm a health coach, right? I've done some training. I've got some credentials. I have a few clients under my belt, and I'm looking for new people. Mm -hmm. I approach your health. What is it that you're selling to me, and what is it that I'm getting for my money? Yeah, so we, we're actually, uh, so first of all, we have uh, amazing investors uh, that we decided at least through the, this year, the platform is going to be free to the coaches. Um, what it helps you, so today, the way we look at it, uh, outside of a few other platforms, our competition is the Excel spreadsheets and PayPal and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and all of these tools that health and wellness coaches have been using with their clients. This is an all-in-one uh, administrative solution, number one, to help you become much more efficient in your business. So you can you know, sign up, you create your profile, you create your practice, you create your set of programs, you decide where to take payments, you decide how do you design the program, you have a bunch of stuff in your toolbox. So for example, we just released um, kind of a, almost think of it as like a survey monkey for health coaches within the app. Uh, so questionnaire, because part of what a health and wellness coach does, initial assessments, ongoing, um, uh, on, ongoing goal setup, um, et cetera. So again, at the core of it, we're actually not promising the coaches anything more than a practice management solution to simplify their business. Where we're exploring and where we're finding today, um, you know, consumers are downloading your coach, even though we haven't spent even an, out, an ounce uh, or a penny, right, um, on any kind of advertising towards the consumers. But we're finding consumers are finding your coach and actually requesting uh, health and wellness coaching. And so we're sort of looking at this uh, as a marketplace. Uh, but we're, again, we want to be uh, very clear to the coaches on the core proposition, which is uh, practice management solution. So where, what is the business model? So if the coaches are getting your software or this platform for free, and I'm assuming that patients or consumers are able to download the apps for free. What is the business model? So today, first of all, today, um, you know, I think when COVID hit and we realized, um, you know, quite a few people are being challenged around the world, AKA, you know, 7 billion. Um, I, I think health and wellness coaching um, also, you know, a huge tailwind there. So the, the short version of that is, Today, it's free to the health coaches. Uh, we foresee, you know, early next year, we're going to start charging um, as a freemium model. So that's, that's kind of model number one. On the business model and other potential revenues, uh, you know, we have tons of ideas and tons of experiments that we're constantly kind of testing and proving the hypothesis one way or the other. Um, you can probably imagine quite a few on the consumer side, but it's a little bit too early to disclose and talk much more detail. At the core of it, the business model is a freemium practice management solution. It just happens to be during this pandemic and through the end of the year, we are giving this for free to the coaches. Yeah, and so it sounds really awesome. And so, but it sounds like you also haven't put a tremendous amount of money in advertising and marketing, either to the health coaches or to patients. So tell us, how are people coming across your health? Um, and did you find a market change or inflection point um, when the COVID-19 pandemic occurred? Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, one quick comment, and this is a little bit of uh, where Marina is coming from, and I've been um, also even with my bear hat on at the time. Um, Marina's comment was always, I don't want to actually be called a patient. Uh, being a patient is just a small slice of my life, right? Um, and so we kind of generally say individuals or health consumers. Um, and so that's just one, one quick side comment, um, because also this is not, you know, health coaching is not necessarily for patients. Of course, I mean, there's a, a lot of things that are happening around, you know, disease reversal, you know, uh, special metabolic diseases, um, you know, and all the way through prevention. We always say that, um, you know, how do you as an individual become the better version of yourself? And whether you are a patient or trying to reverse a metabolic disease or you're a healthy individual. So that just a little bit of a side comment on that. 
Um, secondly, um, I think your, your, your question on, um, you know, we are seven months into it. I, I, I hate actually using the term growth hacking, but uh, we, because our model is not, you know, focused on end consumers today, we have not spent a penny. We actually haven't spent almost anything um, on any kind of advertising towards the coaches. I think right now it's been just building. We just for, you know, for the listeners, we've, we, we're close to about 400 health, health and wellness coaches on the platform already. Um, it's, you know, Marina, myself and the team, um, it's uh, getting to know that community, uh, which is probably one of the kindest communities that I've come across, uh, honestly. Um, and we've been just getting, you know, a lot of word of mouth, uh, tons of word of mouth, uh, actually. Uh, and I think part of it, it, it is a modern platform. Um, you know, sure, there's a lot of room for improvement always, and we're constantly getting the feedback. And then what's happening is even a coach needs a coach. So a lot of coaches have coaches um, that, are, that are also spreading the word about your, uh, your coach health uh, as well. So to this date, we have not focused on paid advertising at all. We actually that's don't really believe that that's the way to do it. It's really uh, yeah. neat. And as I was mentioning, I'm sure there's probably been an inflection since COVID-19, because as soon as people are looking at anything that's virtual, um, it's probably had its own innate organic uh, growth. Now, when we're talking about business models and thinking about everything and all things digital, we know that there's been a lot of changes, legislation, regulation, regulation changes in the governmental level, NIH, the FDA, Health Canada, et cetera, on incorporating digital therapeutics and software as medical devices, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at Health Coach as potentially being an interception point or um, a, 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 an intervention, if you will, in people's health journey, mm -hmm. is, has that been something that would be considered with either you or your venture um, investors to consider doing some shorter long-term studies uh, to gather some real-world evidence to determine if your app or your marketplace actually makes a change in people's health journeys, outcomes, trajectories, versus those people who do not use health coaches. Yeah, yeah. so first and foremost, I'll say, and, uh, and it's interesting because somebody just kind of reached out or, or publicly said, well, you know, your coach health is not a digital therapeutic. Um, and no, we're not. Um, and, and actually, um, uh, just wanted to also get it out there. So uh, I, I don't want to get into the definitions of digital therapeutic. I think it's a whole other topic. Um, and the DTA has done a great job. So the Digital Therapeutic Alliance kind of defining this, et cetera. So that's uh, a little bit of a comment there. Um, <clears throat> depending on where our model goes, um, you know, what we've been finding, and again, probably part of it is because of my background in the space, um, and being, you know, on the farm pharmaceutical side and working with a number of digital therapeutic companies and health and services companies, I hate using the term adherence, but um, to the pill because nobody wants to be told you're non-adherent. Um, the very short version of it, what we're finding and what we're basically saying as a company, your your coach health is. While technology is advanced, and we can talk about cognitive behavioral therapies, um, and you know that, that have been digitized you know, digital therapeutics, at the end of the day, um, you know, human beings and empathy is still for the foreseeable future, never say never, but for the foreseeable future is still required, um, you know, to help human beings along their journey um, and towards wellness, whatever that means and however it's defined. To answer your question on the studies, we haven't crossed that bridge yet, uh, just because, um, again, uh, we are, you know, at the core of it uh, is a practice management solution. So we do not, unlike other health and wellness coaching platforms uh, and services, we do not prescribe or help scribe uh, to coaches what they should do. You know, they are uh, educated, they have their certifications, they have their clients. Um, you know, some of the things that we could be exploring in particular around certain therapeutic areas, but also I would point you guys to a report that we did um, as your coach health around health and wellness coaching industry. There's been close to 200 clinical trials done with another service or therapeutic, but also standalone on benefit of health and wellness coaching. Uh, 
Um, and I think about half of them completed, about half of them were recruiting or in progress as of the publishing of the report. Very interesting. That'll be really neat stuff to, to start reporting out um, for your business uh, as well as it, as it continues to grow. So as we're talking about business models and opportunities and partnerships and things, um, from your background in the pharma space and the life science space, there's a myriad of various people in the uh, stakeholders that may find your platform very interesting to leverage for their own groups. So let's actually just take a look at pharma in general. Is there an opportunity to work, work with partner, uh, et cetera, with a variety of different teams and brands on their specific patient support programs, uh, you know, loss of exclusivity options or opportunities or, or otherwise extensions of what they're doing by adding this kind of health partnership, health coaching addendum um, as something that augments what they're selling in the market as well. Yep. Um, so for our business, and maybe because of my background, uh, we're actually not talking to any pharmaceutical companies um, at all around any of those. I, we do believe that there's a, a tremendous need, especially what you mentioned this around patient support programs. Um, you know, but you know, one thing to remember is a health and wellness coach, as it's defined by the national board, um, and I'll paraphrase it, but it's a you know science back behavior driven, but non-clinical, right? And in talking um, to guide to towards reaching your health goals. And I think for the first time uh, in the 15 to 20 years that the health coaching industry existed. Uh, in December of last year, but really officially in January, the American Medical Association actually did qualify a health and wellness coach um, as a non-clinical member of the healthcare team and also released, released test codes, CPT codes, uh, for health and wellness coaches specifically. The reason I'm bringing this up in the context of pharma, um, what you mentioned, um, I still think it's very uh, early on, especially where we, you and I started the discussion, it's highly regulated. Health and wellness coaching is not clinical in nature. This is around setting and motivating your clients. And notice I don't say patients, but clients towards your goals. Um, on top of that all, I think, um, you know, the, I'll, I'll say a little bit of the bruise, bruises or the scars, knowing how pharma operates. And one of the chapters is, you know, Swiss cheese decision making. Um, it's way too long of, you know, cycles um, to what we're doing now to even go there. Yeah, totally, totally get it. You also talked about pharmacy benefit managers. We talked about payers, both public and private. Um, there could be some really interesting incentives here of potentially partnering with workplaces and um, and third party insurance groups who can see potentially by leveraging a platform like yourselves. They can improve the quality and quantity of people's life, which as you know, all gets quantified and, and uh, you know, somebody actualizes all these things into numbers. Is that something that's also of interest or you wanna keep the, your platform very separate from those entities as well? Um, so at this point in life, um, and, and I would almost say, you know, we're just a young little kid uh, as a company. Um, we do want to keep this separate and i think you know we we very much believe in the health consumerism and therefore you know some and, and holistic care um and health and not only care so at this point um you know we we are looking at some of these experiments outside of the the existing system let's put it that way right uh, the, the the business experiments yeah and that totally makes sense and um since COVID-19, I'm just curious about any new ideas that have come through with, between you and Marina and the team about where you want to take your health. Um, there has been a huge uptake and uptick of telehealth, which is naturally what your coaches have been doing or yep. leveraging through, the, through your, your business management system. And I'm just curious on that level, you know, governmental interventions, potential for, you know, uh, an, support financially about being able to build, you know, we've heard a lot of, you know, 
what's going on with Teladoc and all sorts of other telehealth um, platforms. Yep. Is that of interest to pursue that specifically? Or is there an interest in maybe super specializing what it is that your health focuses on? Because as we know, there's a huge impact on COVID on mental health, addiction, um, you know, and those can be alcohol, drug related, food addictions. Has there been any um, consideration on that or is that potentially part of your future plans? Yeah. Um so first of all, we did see, I would say we tripled uh, the number of coaches in this time period. Uh, and I think it's been, you know, due to the pandemic and we kind of been, been saying almost from the beginning, telecoaching um, uh, as part of the platform, it's there. Uh, we've seen usage absolutely spike for, you know, through the last three, four months uh, specifically. Uh, well, time flies, uh, so since March time frame. We are focused on the U.S. market, uh, even though we don't restrict coaches from around the world joining. So we have coaches from, you know, Mongolia and Bahrain um, and Germany and, you know, all around. But we're focused as a company on, on U.S. Uh, and growth. Um, you know, as far as the, um, you know, everything from reimbursements and tele medicine, you know, just like a telemedicine company today, I mean, we've seen quite a lot of announcements recently around telemedicine, right? So, uh, you know, Teladoc and Livongo, uh, you know, Mwell, um, you know, getting an investment of 100 million from Google, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's been tremendous growth, but, you know, my prediction personally is that we'll also see quite a lot of consolidation based on the content and therapeutic areas um, to provide you know, not just the pipe for, you know, the front end, but also services and support for health consumers. We do believe that health coaching will get there as well. But if you look at the nascency of the industry still, um, it, there's still not as much from a regulatory perspective. There is a national uh, board of health and wellness coaches that's been set up and working with the AMA. It's still in its infancy. So we look at it very much of, uh, you know, let's provide the platform form for these coaches and what we're finding to answer your question directly is that there's such an amazing set of niche specialties within health and wellness coaching uh, you know we have a coach that only focuses on stem professionals and their sleep patterns right we have you know coaches that focus on you know uh, women between 30 and 45 going through xyz right uh, it really gets so niche and amazingly so. Um, and those are the coaches that are experiencing in the front lines. Um, and, and interestingly enough, prior to the pandemic, we were calling our report uh, health coaching industries, the new front lines of health um, and not health care. Um, so I'll, I'll pause here. because quite a. And I, I love the fact that you're focusing on uh, health consumers. I love the fact that you're approaching this from a wellness place as opposed to a sickness place. It's like, it's a proactive approach. Um, and I think what's really super exciting about this, Eugene, is the prospects of how billing codes may change in the future in the direction of coaches. Because as you mentioned, these are the new frontliners. They're, they're dotted across communities. They're in your backyard. They're your next door neighbor. So as opposed to having to drive to a clinic or to a hospital, and all of the expense and aggravation and hassle and all sorts of things, these could potentially become the new extension of our healthcare system. And the people who are in the woods, in the weeds, doing the day-to-day, -day, helping people through what they need. So I think it's truly inspiring and very, very exciting work. So we got a long way to go. <laughs> and we all do. Life is a journey. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious, you know, there's obviously data being collected through your systems all those sorts of things. Is there ever being, is there anybody bringing up the question or the concern around data privacy, what's happening with it, how it's being managed, who this information may or may not be getting sold to, and what's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, the, the very, very short version is we are now HIPAA compliant officially. Um, um, and then um, uh, the second piece, we are, because we're focused on U.S., um, you know, we are getting going through kind of GDPR compliance, uh, literally as we speak. Uh, we uh, have committed as a company, again, this is a practice management solution for 
coaches and helping them improve this. And this is why we're sort of looking at this and entertaining the models that we are. Um, and obviously working with our whole team uh, to ensure that that safety privacy um, is, is number one on the list as well. So it's, it's no, no doubt about it. We've been, uh, I think from, from the perspective of uh, coming from a regulated industry myself and being in there, but also having the experience in the startup world uh, and, you know, our partners uh, in the business, uh, you know, all, all behind it. That's a very short version as I can get. So, so lingering a little bit on your, your experience and your world around the startup community, you also have founded the Initium Impact Ventures. I'm just curious about what kind of work you're doing there, um, how that has impacted your health or not or other startups, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing in that space. Yeah, uh, to, to be honest, uh, this is, uh, you know, I, when I left Bayer or Bayer, which I was cited upon you are on, um, you know, I, I decided to obviously crack open um, in, Initium uh, as well as join my wife. Um, I think I probably underestimated, well, it's about a thousand percent of my time is spent with your coach health. Um, and I really have not had any time uh, pursued. Now I talk to entrepreneurs on a weekly basis. I still do my, what I used to do back at buyers, uh, buyer time, serendipity calls. Um, so people that connect to me on LinkedIn, I always ask, you know, how can I help or what, you know, what can I learn from you? And so the initium is more of a concept right now, but I do believe, uh, I guess the short version of where at some point I'll have more time on this, um, where, where we want to take it is I do believe that, um, you, you know, impact and social impact, uh, even with the social impact, people can still have a profitable business. Um, and so I do believe in, in an investment thesis around social impact. So that's kind of the very short version, but I'm not active, actively doing that at all right now. But it's nice that it's there in the background. So when yes, when, when, when it's time, <laughs> when it's time. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about this exciting YouTube and podcast channel that you call <laughs> the Shot of Digital Health Therapy. Tell us, was it COVID-19 that prompted that? I know so many people who started their podcasts at that time when they were kind of trapped at home, uh, you know, re relegated to staying in the house and they started their channels. When did you start it and kind of what's been some of the more exciting things that you're, you've been doing on this, on your channel? Yeah. So, um, we started this, uh, so Jim Joyce and I, we've, uh, we've known each other for a number of years through the health Excel network and beyond. And, you know, what we found is we always kind of at the bar after the event talk and there's real talk, right? Real talk about digital health, real talk about what is that future? What are the things that are happening? And, you know, every time we saw each other, we kind of say, yeah, we need to do this. We need to do this. Um, you know, we, um, my, the family and I, we, uh, you know, we uh, came to U.S., uh, you know, left Berlin sometime mid-March um, and then kind of landed here. And Jim Pingman said, hey, let's do this. This is, you know, this is our own therapy, uh, Wednesday to Wednesday. So, you know, to be honest, we actually do this for the two of us more or less um, <laughs> as two extroverts uh, you know missing that stage time um, and it's good to connect and then we invite you know many different individuals from the industry um, to be part of this craziness every Wednesday <laughs> um, awesome. and just, just, just have fun with it honestly uh, you know we do joke around that you know we want to get into the Joe Rogan uh, territory but <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day this is for for our um, therapy um, more than anything else. I love it and it's so authentically said. I totally get it and I appreciate that as well too. So good for you. And that's yeah. sometimes the best way is to organically grow it just because you love something as opposed to trying to push something through like so many people do for marketing reasons. So um, absolutely. And, and actually J Jim's wife, I think, uh, called, uh, called it uh, meticulously unproduced and now it's the byline, which is true. <laughs> like it. some. Some weeks we even forget to invite our guests and we're like, you know. <laughs> that is brilliant. What a great tagline. I love the handle on that one. Yeah. So, so Eugene, since COVID-19 and just, again, because of your digital background and your knowledge, what are some of the things that you are super stoked about from a technology standpoint? What's coming up that you really want to get your fingers on? Yeah. 
So, you know, and, and it depends on, I'll, I'll say kind of the sub industry piece of this in, in the health and care. Um, you know, I think we've been, we've seen in the last, let's say four or five months now, um, you know, governments moving, right? So think about the digital therapeutics, especially for, um, uh, you know, for certain conditions, you know, straight out to market, um, and which means that that allows digital therapeutics to actually gain the, the, the real world data. Notice I don't say evidence um, to actually show the benefits of it. <clears throat> um, you know, I think while diagnostics always have been there, um, I think, you know, the COVID-19 has exposed a dire need for more investment in that area, um, you know, across multitude of things. I mean, look at what, uh, you know, Freenome just raised another 260 million for, you know, cancer diagnostics. And I think we will see, you know, further explosion in a positive way, uh, not just an in investment, but I think on people's um, creativity and followed by the investment, we'll see quite a lot in there. Um, you know, maybe somewhat selfishly speaking from our business perspective, um, we do believe that um, human beings and actually enabling human beings with the right technologies and need, but you cannot take human beings away from the process, at least, especially by the way, during when, um, you know, we've seen numbers, something like 40, 50% are getting into that mental health area where people are struggling and challenged, right? Um, and I, you know, one would argue there are certain things that can help you through it as a technology, but ultimately, you know, how do you actually work with an individual to help you through it? Um, you know, I, I think we'll see quite a lot of consolidation, uh, which would be interesting. And on one side, some startups are saying, well, so do I stop working on a DTX for disease area A or B because, you know, Teledongo, um, you know, will, you know, will basically come up with a new indication. And my answer is, uh, as, a, as a society, we've been innovating for centuries and centuries. So don't stop innovating. Um, I think the human kind will need more. Um, but I do see some consolidation in that space happening um, where the telemedicine companies of the world are becoming truly services and front lines. Um, and then the last thing is I'll, I'll don't write off the, uh, the big conglomerates in health like, you know, you know, CVS and the United to the world. They've been getting a much more aggressive in that space. Um, so that's kind of my crystal ball. Yeah, so exciting stuff. Um, a couple of things I just want to touch on, on 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 some of your ideas and just sort of spin on those a little bit. But first of all, around the monopolistic, I guess, concerns of today, we're hearing a lot going on in the big consumer tech space, you know, the big fang companies, uh, the antitrust concerns around smaller entrepreneurial companies being able to, to be able to compete and there's all that conversation. So are you suggesting that there's good and bad to that, that although the Uniteds, et cetera, are still there, you're still encouraging the small entrepreneur startup idea to still pursue their dreams and their ideas? And are you suggesting that they can still compete, can compete in, in, the, in this increasingly monopolistic um, ecosystem that we're finding ourselves? I think absolutely can compete because one of the things that we cannot forget, and you know, uh, sure, maybe tech giants can move quicker than the traditional health and care companies, um, but I think the uh, from a you know resource and talent pool perspective, we are seeing much more tech savvy uh, people in the uh, you know in the health and care space, but we also see much more clinically focused in the tech. And I would say, but both combined still can't move at the speed and agility of a younger company and set of entrepreneurs. And so there will always be opportunity and a market, you know, finding opportunity for startups. I, I you know, sometimes you say never say never, but I, I'm actually willing to bet that um, will always be opportunity for young companies. The, the piece around sort of the monopolistic and I think specifically targeted towards the tech giants piece my comment there is a little bit, I, I think, you know, in the last couple of years, well, the well, tech giants now completely get into the health and care space um, and monopolize it there and the incumbents can't keep up. My comment is actually the incumbents are uh, trying to speed up and actually doing quite a lot of everything from investment to their own teams. And so I think that will actually put pressure across the ecosystem to still improve, even though we start to see some consolidation. 
I love the silver lining uh, uh, belief system there, Eugene. It's very inspiring. Um, you, you also talked a lot about not being able to replace the, imp the empathy component of the human interaction. We're hearing all kinds of dy uh, dystonian concerns around artificial general intelligence. You know, this obviously was spearheaded by Elon Musk um, and all sorts of other writers and science fiction writers since that. Um, you know, uh, Nick uh, Bostrom ha has written about it. Eric Topol has written lots of books about sort of the new frontier and the way diagnostics are going to be done and robots and machines. Um, we've even heard statistics. You know, we've probably all seen the, the movie Her um, and companies like Replica and heard that statistics that when people start talking about mental health concerns and issues, many people feel a lot more gravitas and connection and ability to let go and release to an automated chat bot, like a Wobot or something like that, than they do to a real human being. So do you have a slightly different perspective on, on that view about what it means to be uh, a computer or consciousness and you know what it truly means to be an empathic uh, coach. Yep. So I, you know, let, let's break this down a little bit. So first of all, um, just like um, you know, uh, if I if we look at the pharmaceutical industry, you know, one size fits all, mass produced, right, versus personalized medicine, uh, and I would say not versus necessarily, but with it. Um, we can apply the same kind of thinking because every single approach is very highly individualized, right? And for example, you know, I, I was using Replica early on. I didn't like my digital twin. <laughs> uh, I kind of, I put, I put that to the side. Um, I also think it depends on where you are in your life in particular, um, I would say areas that you're challenged with and struggling with. So, so and, and, and your personal life, personal wants, needs, uh, desires, and approaches. So, for example, there's some individuals that are very happy with a fully AI fitness instructor. Not me, right? Uh, I, you know, when I was living in Amsterdam, I had a kind of a, a, a you know, product I signed up for that actually had a real fitness coach that you have a, you know, initially a video call with, and, could, you know, if you live in the vicinity, go for a run. I want to be responsible to someone else and not to the technology, right, um, itself. But there are other individuals that are okay with it. So I still think there's a, will be room for both completely automated, um, you know, everything from chatbots for certain areas. And I think we'll, there will still be room, again, for foreseeable future for, you know, empathy and individualized approaches to things. And look what, you know, I, I miss hugs. I, I miss seeing people at, you know, locations. I need a, you know, I, I need a, a fully, you know, fully human being to give a hug to. And, you know, my 16 year old, 18 year olds are probably sick of me hugging them already at this point, even though at first <laughs> they enjoyed it, so. It's so funny that you say that, believe it or not, there's actually a professional hugging association and there's people who do that for a living, but that's a whole other discussion. But I believe what it. Was, <laughs> what I think is really interesting here, Eugene, is I think what we're really talking about here is the the N equals one. Um, I actually wrote about that, that in my healthcare heretic. So we really are getting into this micro specialized precision medicine or management of the N equals one individual. So we used to talk about these as biohackers and people trying things on them and drawing conclusions, but we truly are getting to a place where we've got something for everybody and we're not niching people into or, or pushing everybody into you're either a, you know, a size small, medium, or large. Now there's like every increment in, in between. And what you're suggesting is that your solution is one of many things that people can pick and choose based on their own parameters and specifics. Which brings me to, the, to my next question, which really is about the empowered health consumer. So they're so used to being on the back end or being the receiver, as opposed to the person who's pushing it forward. So opportunities like blockchain, being able to have full ownership of their own health data, being able to own it and potentially monetize it. And then the next question on top of that is being able to crowdsource other people who have your same condition, crowdsourcing things like private insurance based on your health parameters, and so many other empowered opportunities. 
Do you have any thoughts about what that looks like in the future with the empowered um, health consumer? Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be a little bit of a contrarian on that, uh, because if I rewind back, actually, I mean, there have been groups like ACOR.org, uh, you know, Gilles Freeman, for example, back in the day that started, you know, really a newsletter, um, you know, new, uh, I don't even remember the name of listserv kind of concept between, you know, cancer patients that were literally almost solving uh, each other's problems and challenges through this and, and sharing a lot of things. I don't know what an empowered health consumer really means, to be honest, because I think, um, again, uh, while that technology is there, uh, back to what I kind of started with, you know, it needs to be easy to use, it needs to be transparent in its use, um, and I also don't think that blockchain will solve everybody's problems, because if you rewind back, you know, the Google Health trial, the original version of that, right? You know, I could have shared all my documents with my docs. I could have done quite a lot. And in theory, I put in quotes, was secure. Blockchain or not, and I know there's benefits of it, right? I think ultimately, um, and, you know, a dear friend who passed away, uh, uh, Michael Saris, who was an e-patient, um, he kind of said this. I was on a, on a stage with him at one point that, unfortunately, until you get diagnosed with something, as a regular consumer, you don't care quite a lot, right? Um, now, my hope is for the next and future generation, and I'm looking at my kids who are trying to eat healthy, who are, um, you know, are constantly exercising, who are cognitive of, you know, air quality and th things that are you know, a lot of the social determinants of health as well, you know, is the future generation and how do we educate them. Uh, but I, I just, I don't necessarily see that all of a sudden blockchain, uh, and again, I'm picking that as an example just because you mentioned it will all of a sudden turn everybody you know, upside down and all of a sudden I care about my health and preventing my you know, next disease, right? Uh, and be cognitive about it. Um, last thing I'll say on it, however, again, I'm very much, my cup is always half full uh, or I try to be. So um, you have to look through that silver lining. I think what COVID-19 has exposed is quite a lot of differences across social determinants of health. Um, you know, from geographic areas, from diversity of our populations, um, from uh, status, um, but also um, to understanding that, you know, uh, diseases, especially metabolic diseases, are actually a big, big component of that equation, right, uh, of, of being tackled by COVID. So I think it did expose quite a bit in the masses that, you know, and I put it in quotes because what is being healthy, but being healthy is a good thing. And how do I go about it? Right. Yeah. And, you know, so many important words there, like you were saying, Eugene, we can literally speak for hours on some of the things that you're bringing up. But I think as a, a closing comments, as we reach the top of the hour, there is so much going on in the world right now, Eugene, um, COVID-19 being honestly the catalyst to this exposure, but now we're suddenly hit with a, a literally a tsunami of other predicaments. Everything from climate issues to social issues to economic issues, and the list goes on. All of this inevitably is going to impact people's impression of what it means to be somebody with health and well uh, health and wellness. What is your hope? for the future? What is the silver lining and what is it that you try to look forward to as we're kind of swimming through this quagmire right now? Yeah, um, you know, I, that's a deep, deep question on a morning here, but, but. <laughs> you need another cup of coffee? <laughs> um, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. Um, you know, I, I, I know this is crazy and I, and I don't wanna, um, I, I think it's, it is that empathy, notice I don't say sympathy uh, for other human beings, because at the end of the day, if you rewind again, centuries, while it's hitting us because we're living now and all of us around us, it's hitting us very hard, you know, as individuals, as families, as a society, but um, societies have been going, right? I mean, there's been plagues, there's been wars, there've been, and I think a lot of this, at the end of the day, it's the empathy and kindness to each other um, is uh, the only quote unquote two pills that you can swallow to get through this. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, you know, strong believer and, and not to sound, you know, 
kind of area on it, but I, I really do mean that it, you know, just try to get into other people's shoes throughout the day. I think that's a beautiful way to end this. And I just want to say, I'm super excited. I love the sound of your book. The title is amazing. Please let us know once it's written. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure. We could literally speak to you for hours about this on a variety of these really, you know, tangent, you know, crunchy topics. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Eugene. For anybody who's listening, we will be forwarding the link to this YouTube and podcast if you want to send this to any friends or listen to it again. Um, we will also be sharing Eugene's information and website if you want to connect with him as well to learn about more about your health. And certainly, please connect with us at Impetus Digital. These are the kinds of courageous conversations that we want to bridge, that we want to be able to link people and things and ideas and concepts, because we really believe that everything starts with a thought and a courageous conversation, going beyond the pill discussions and getting into these bigger, juicier, provocative topics so that we can truly all collectively work to positively disrupt healthcare. So thank you so much, Eugene, for your time today, uh, for everybody who attended. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much and uh, wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead. Thank you.